So I want you to think, we're always seeking to apply the word of God. And I want you to think about some things that you're going through. Uh, Maybe you feel stuck. Uh, That's the title of this message or this series because we're talking about Joseph. He keeps getting stuck. And if you know the story, every time he gets stuck, God is up to something. And I want you to be empowered and encouraged today that regardless of how you might feel that you are stuck in life, God is at work. I want you to leave encouraged, trusting him more because all of us have faced things in our lives where we wonder, God, how is it that you're, you're in control if this thing has happened to me? Many of us could look back on our past. Maybe it's a recent past where things have happened to us, where we've been betrayed. We have been the other side of, of hateful actions or words Maybe we've been victimized in the past. This gets real tender for some of us. Maybe certain things were done to us and it has impacted our lives and still impacts us today. And then there's been other times, if we're honest, we've been the oppressor. We've been the one who's hurt others. We've been the one who's let others down. And through it all, we wonder, God, where are you? And you're walking through something, even now, maybe you feel stuck or you, you wonder, it seems that God's plans have been denied. It seems that he, he was at work, but now this thing happened. And then we start to play the if only game. If only that person hadn't done that to me, I wouldn't be where I am. If only I hadn't gone up against that and lost this job, I wouldn't be where I am today. If only I was born into a Christian. If only I was born into this family. Or that. If only this had happened, that wouldn't have happened. And I wouldn't be where I am today. To have that kind of approach or perspective on life says more about what you believe about God than any circumstances that have happened in your life. Because God is always at work in your life. That's what I want you to see. Through the good and yes, through the bad. He's at work. How in the world does God take even evil, things that happen to us, or how about things that we have done, and he flips it, he turns it for our good. You know the scripture tells us that. And today I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know today his plans cannot be denied. And we're going to see that. In Genesis chapter 37, I want you to turn there. Genesis 37, we're going to look at verses 12 through 36. It's a a story that you might know if you know the story of Joseph. Now, this is worth noting. If you've read this story before, you know where it heads. You'll you'll be given some details. Oh, I remember that. I remember that. Perhaps. Maybe it's the first time you've ever read this story. If you're tracking the story, it reads like a great novel, like a great movie, where you're, you have no idea what's going to happen. He keeps getting stuck. And what seems like a normal day in the life of Joseph becomes what I think is the worst day of his life. And as you're, you're turning there, Genesis 37, everyone turning to script. I'm not going to show all the verses up here today. I want you to turn there and you have your journal Um, It's chapter 37 of Genesis. You can write and take notes. I'll offer an outline here in a moment that you'll want to write down, take with you. I just want to pause for a minute again and say, way to go, church family. What we saw this week with VBS was an intergenerational blessing of the next generation. That's what it was. It it was a picture of the church at its best. Because here's what we did. You saw all the, the craziness and all the fun. But when a church decides, how about this? When adults decide, the already convinced decide, we're going to do whatever it takes to bring the gospel to the next generation. We wear different clothes. We wore what they were wearing. We we sang some crazy songs. We did some hand motions. There's a lot of that going on. We danced around. I saw some of y'all dancing. People say, Baptists don't dance. I say, we don't dance very well, but we dance. (laughs) We were dancing. We were having a butt. We got slimed. We did it all. Watch this. We denied our preferences for the sake of the next generation. Can I get an amen, brothers? It's what we do. We all need to do that. Our church needs to constantly pass the gospel on to the next generation. 
And so way to go church. And if you're unable to be here this week, a few things. One, uh, we decided we're going to do it next year. We, Lissetta Lair told me, we've already got the curriculum for next year. You can be a part of it. It's the happiest week of the year. Uh, you, your giving has made it happen. You've been a part of that. If you are giving to the ministry of this church. And then thirdly, we care for preschoolers and children, students every, every week, every Sunday. Talking to Lissetta this morning, we need more preschool workers. Not, not workers, not volunteers, disciple makers. That's what we need. Discipling the next generation. So you, if you love babies, like I know my, my wife Stacy just helped launch a new group. We need more people. It's a new class. We're growing and we need more people to serve the next generation because many of us need to get out of the stands and onto the field. That's, that's some of us. Because what happens, the twist is, and we've all done this, I've done this. You go to church at times and then at lunch you're going, well, I, how was church? I, it was okay. I mean, I didn't like how, I didn't like that song. And then it was too, and the pastor, he preached way too long. It was just too much. I, I didn't, and then that, I don't know. And then, you know, that, I wish they would do this or what. When you come simply to say, give me, get, see what happens is a consumer becomes a critic instead of a servant. If you come with the perspective, Lord, I'm here to worship you. So watch this. Here it is. How was church? You tell me. Did you, you tell me. Did you worship with all your heart? Did you bring everything you had to the Lord? Did you come in to serve others or to be seen or to, you tell me. God is up to something in our church right now and it is exciting. And he is at work here locally and these 30 or so pastors here with us today from around the world tell us he's at work globally. And we praise God. He's moving across the world. The church is alive. And we're going to see today that regardless of what comes our way, we might feel that God's plans have been denied in, in our lives or somehow he, he got stuck maybe. Maybe he's the one that <laughs> got stuck. Now we're stuck because God is either not all powerful or he's not all loving or he would have done this thing. And today you're going to see that nothing can stop him. He is in control of your life. And I want to see, we're going to see three apparent, apparent threats to his sovereignty over our lives. His plans cannot be denied by betrayal. His plans can't be denied by suffering. And his plans cannot be denied by apparent defeat. That's how we'll break it down. You'll see it along the way. We left Joseph last week as this self-adulating, prideful teenager. 17 years old, and his passive father has allowed him to be his favorite, and his brothers, their hatred is growing. This is the most jacked up family in the Bible. It is. This is the most dysfunctional. I mean, maybe there's others, but this is messed up. If you think you come from a dysfunctional family, and part of your story is, well, if I hadn't, if my parents, if Joseph's situation is worse than yours. Unless your siblings put a bounty out on you and decided to kill you. They're making plans, is what we see in this story. Something happened in Joseph's life, though. This hit me this week, studying this. Every one of us have a pivotal moment in our lives where something changed. And maybe it's when you went off to college or you went off to university or you moved or you grew or your, a parent died or something happened to you. Oftentimes, there's a defining moment. The longer you live, the more of them you have. And you either cower away and turn from God or you turn toward him and embrace his grace in your life and see, Lord, what are you doing? You're up to something. I can't figure this out, but I'm going to run to you and it'll change your life. Something happened in Joseph's life that changed him from this self-focused, prideful dreamer, as he was, to an incredible man of integrity, a great leader who would end up second in command to the Pharaoh who would then ultimately establish a nation, 
that would be God's people. And I believe what happened happens in this passage. And I want you to see if you can catch it. Look at verse 12. This will set up um, the three really main points of the body of the message I want you to see. In verse 12, it says, Now his brothers went to the pasture that fathers, um, their father's flock near Shechem. You're just reading this here with me. This is probably a regular occurrence. You know that Joseph in his coat of many colors, right? It's hard to translate, actually. Some, some translations say it's a, co- it's a long sleeve clo- coat. Some say it's an embroidered coat. Um, what it is, so we might say, you know, roll up your sleeve, let's get to work, right? You don't work in a long sleeve robe. He's, it's like he's wearing a suit. That's what it is. His brothers are dressed for work or they're going to take off their shirts or whatever to work. He's walking around in a suit and it's not just a suit. Everybody knows this is one dad gave me. I mean, y'all don't have one, but I got one. And it says they hate him. You may have sibling rivalry going on in your family. They hate this brother. And so he's not out with them working. He's home chilling with his dad and Israel, okay, verse 13, Jacob said to Joseph, he says, okay, I want you to go to find them and come back and give me a report. I want to find your brothers and, 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 and you know, tell them, tell me what's happening. How are they doing? And, and, and a man, so he goes down to the Valley of Hebron and he comes to Shechem. It says in verse 14, and a man found him wandering in the fields. A man found him wandering around in the fields. The man asked him, Who, what, what are you seeking? What, what are you looking for? What are you doing out here? I'm seeing my brothers. Tell me, do you know where they're pastoring? Listen to this. The man said, uh, they've gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went down to see his brothers, found them in Dothan. Now, before we get to the body of this message, listen to this. Coincidentally, Joseph ends up out in the middle of a field somewhere. Coincidentally, there's a man, not five minutes later, ten minutes later, right in the moment, who says, what are you doing out here? Coincidentally, he says, well, I overheard your brothers. That was your brothers. They went down to Dothan. Friends, the first point, probably before the major points of this message, this is for free, like didn't cost you anything. This this is, here it is. God's plans cannot be denied by accident. What we would call consequences, I mean, I mean uh, coincidences. See, often in retrospect, we can look back and go, that chance meeting changed my life. You all are here, and then members of our church, you're here. if you could track it back, you would go, I think, I don't remember the first time I heard about Park City's Baptist Church. I don't remember the first time I was invited here, or maybe you do. You're here right now in this moment because of a divine encounter that you have with someone. Some of you met someone out in the community and they invited you here because that's what we do. There are no accidents in the kingdom of God. And you need to know this. Now, when things don't go our way, and if you know this story, It's not going to go well for Joseph. So Joseph could say, if only I'd been five minutes later, that guy wouldn't have been here. If only he hadn't seen my brothers. If only I hadn't come down right into this field. If only my dad didn't send me out here. And so we played the if only game. Because we don't think that God can work in and through our struggles. Spoiler alert. Joseph will end up as the first Israelite, watch this, the first Israelite in Egypt is a slave. He goes there as a slave. You know that ultimately his brothers, family, they're going to be there. Then suddenly the people of God, these Israelites rising up, enslaved by the Egyptians. And then God does his greatest work, the Exodus in the Old Testament, that only then lands his people, a community of faith, gives them the Ten Commandments, the law, and says, now go, be a holy nation, a light to the nations. Of course, they can't do that. Jesus comes along, the perfect Israelite, fulfills the law. 
He calls us into his family by his spirit that he sends to us. And he says, by his grace, we're drawn in. We become the new Israel. We now are the light to the world, he says. All of this started because of a chance meeting out in the middle of nowhere in a field in Shechem. God is at work in your life. Every encounter you have with a person this week, live this way, will be a divine encounter. Every encounter. And you watch for it. This is a wonderful way to live. Live with wonder and awe and anticipation. I'm meeting somebody at the grocery store. This is a divine encounter right here. I'm going to bless this person. Could change their life. Some of you invite other people to church and it changes the trajectory of a family and generations. We all can be a part of that. When's the last time you invited someone to church? We've got good news to share. So let's continue to realize that God is at work in all things. The grand redemptive story of God's people starts here in the middle of a field with a guy walking around looking for his brothers. There are no accidents. God's plan, let's start here. So I could say God's plan cannot be denied by accidents. But look at this. First of all, God's plan cannot be denied by betrayal, even by betrayal. We tend to blame others. This happened, that happened, and my life would be different if that hadn't happened. Look at verse 18. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes a dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of this dreamer. Now, where is God in the midst of this? Why, why isn't he intervening? Why doesn't he stop these brothers? God knows what's going on. You see, here, here's what's happening. Too often we see a coincidence. We see a happy accident or a tragic event, and yet we deny that God is working. We think that others' decisions or our own overpower God's will. Like maybe he's not all powerful, actually. Our will can come against him. But what we see here in Joseph's story, it's a wonderful blend of God's direct intervention and his indirect guidance of seemingly unfortunate and fortunate events. Look at verse 21. But when Reuben, he's the eldest, you might know, heard it, he rescued him out of their hands. So it sounds like maybe they're showing up at different times. These guys have been out and about. He comes, he shows up. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Let's not take his life. And Reuben said to him, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness. But do not lay a hand on him. Some have questioned his motives. If you know Reuben's story, he's at odds with his dad. So he might be, hey, I'm going to be the hero is what I'm going to be. I'm going to get back in good graces with my father that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. That, that's, his, that's his line. Like, I'm going I'm I'm to come get him later. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, stripped him of his identity, the very thing that represented the thing that they hated the most about him, they strip him of his robe, of his status, if you will, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There's no water in it. God's plan cannot be denied, even by betrayal. As we'll see this, you've been perhaps betrayed. You have been the one on the other side of some really bad decisions that some people have made in your life. That doesn't stop God. He's not finished with you. He's at work in your life. He's, he's working that out for good. Watch this. Secondly, God's plan cannot be denied even in suffering. And when I say suffering, I'm talking about animosity. I'm talking about evil. I'm talking about hatred. God's plan cannot be denied. Now, if you have never read this story, and if you're reading Genesis, you would know that in chapter 34, Levi and Simeon, two of the older brothers, have already killed a bunch of men. 
So it's like any movie or, right, or novel, you're reading it and somebody, this guy kills that guy at the beginning. So later on, you're just nervous. This guy, he, he's going to kill somebody else. Or right now, he's already killed. These guys, you might remember the story. There's a group of men who just had circumcision. Uh, and, and so they thought, this is a good time to attack these guys. And they did. Killed a host of guys. Now they're here. These guys are ruthless. They are evil. And they're coming after Joseph. So, so God uses normal, even, watch this, even sinful people to accomplish his plans? Why does he do that? Because that's all he's got. That's all he's got. He's got us. And I know, wait, well, I've never killed anyone. If you have anger in your heart, Jesus says you, you, you're a murderer. If you lust in your heart, you're, you're an adulterer. Look how heartless these guys are. Look at verse 25. Then they sat down to eat. <laughs> hey, we just left our brother for dead. Hey, pass the ketchup. Give me more potato chips, you know, or whatever. I mean, these guys are ruthless. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites. You might know this story. Coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh and on their way. We know exactly where this, this trade route was. Way, way to, and by the way, Shechem, where they are, Dothan is, Dothan is north of Shechem, which is north of Samaria, if you know the Bible lands, uh, to the west of the Sea of Galilee. So they're not as high as, as Galilee. It's kind of Samaria, okay? So they're, they're here in, in the Holy Land, right, right there in the middle of Israel. I think today it's part of the West Bank. Um, and here they are, and then it says, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Have you ever noticed? It's always down, down, down to Egypt. Now that's south, but it's also, I think, yeah, it's, they're going down to Egypt. It's always down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it? And Judah, he's thinking, hey, let's not kill him. You can see his blood. Come, let us sell him. Let's get something out of this. Of the Ishmaelites, and, and let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother. He's our own flesh. <laughs> Lots of love. No, he's our brother. Let's just sell him as a slave. Right? Ruthless. And his brothers listened to him. They, okay. Then, then, then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up, and, and, and they, they lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Wow. I want you to pause for a minute and consider two very important points here. With all the animosity, with all the revenge and anger that's going on here, God cannot be stopped by it. This is what we're going to see. Only God can do this. I, I, I've learned that, that a good way to talk about God's will is a lot of us think of it as a tightrope. Like if I step off of this thing, I'm going to fall and I'm going to destroy my life. Or if somebody nudges me and I fall, it's going to ruin everything. God's will is not as much a tightrope as it is a playing field. With boundaries. Yes, commands. And God says, love me with all your heart. Jesus said it. Love others as I love you. And here it is. Love God, love others, do stuff. Love God, love others, go. Do that. You do that, you find yourself in the center of God's will. A lot of times we ask, what is God's will for my life? Even that is a selfish question. It's the wrong question. There's a question before that question. The question is, what is God's will? What is he up to in the world? Join him in that. Bam, you're right at the center of his will. This is how we keep pressing on. As the story goes, the victim is elevated. Joseph suffers unjustly, but ultimately God redeems it. And he's doing it in your life as well. Because this is the way of the cross. 
How do you recognize it when he's doing it? How do you follow the pattern? It's the pattern that he's always doing in the world. And it's not the way the world thinks. We need to think differently. How do you recognize God's hand at work? We look at Jesus. And you think, oh, Jeff, Jesus is always the answer. No, no, no. Look at the pattern of his life because this is what God is doing in your life. Jesus was betrayed by his own. Jesus was sold to become a slave, if you will, uh, beaten and tortured as a substitute. Jesus was the one who was tossed into the pit from the cross to the tomb. Jesus was the one. Joseph was figuratively resurrected. Jesus was literally resurrected. And this is what he's up to in your life. He's always redeeming everything that he allows. And he's doing it right now. Are you thinking with me? How are you going to apply this to your life? Look, the people who hold the solution to the world's problems are former slaves. What's happening in Joseph's life micro, uh, in a microcosm, in a micro, is happening in God's people on the macro level, and it's happening in your life and mine. We know what it is to be enslaved. We know what it is to be set free. We now are the light to the world. We can go and tell others. This story is all over the Bible. And in Luke 4, it's, Jesus said he came to rescue the captives, to set at liberty the oppressed. And he says, go and do this with me. And it's all over the Bible. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And then he says, you live that way too. But listen, if you're oppressed, if you're one who's been victimized, if you're hurting, if you're wrestling with what you have gone through, we want to help you. We have a resource to help you. We, we have counseling and, and, and the center and, and therapists that can help you sort through this. Because we all need help with the things that have come at us. But I want you to see this. So, so reach out. Reach out to me. Contact my office. Find me after the service. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. But there's another twist in the story here. And this one will offend the mind. This will offend our sense of justice. But I want you not to miss this. The surprising act of redemption here is not only with Joseph, but with his brothers. The oppressors. These hateful men are ultimately going to be changed as well. Not perfect men, but if you know where this story goes, these are the patriarchs. You know this, right? We read just two weeks ago, Revelation 21, 12, the holy city has 12 gates and on each of the gates are the names of the 12 sons of Israel. Etched for eternity. God is going to use these men. Only God can do this. There's going to be a moment of reconciliation. There's going to be a moment of grace that they see as they are forgiven changes their lives. God is going to use even these guys because God's purpose is his plan cannot be stopped by betrayal by suffering, even by evil intent. And look at this thirdly, finally, God's plan cannot be denied even in apparent defeat. Your anguish, your grief, the dreams that have been crushed, God cannot be stopped. Look at verse 30, uh, 29. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brother. He's the only one with any kind of sense of grief or remorse. The boy is gone and I, where shall I go? He said, what should I do now? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped it, dipped the, blood, the, the robe in the blood. They sent it, the, the robe of many colors, and brought it to their father and said, this we found, please identify whether, is this, this your son's robe or not? Look at this, is this your son's, not our brother, is this your son's robe? Can you imagine, this is heartless. How evil is this? 
They've already stripped Joseph of his identity, tossed him out, sold him as a slave. Now they're eliminating him from Jacob's life altogether. The favored son, and they're probably enjoying it, finally. I mean, dad has been the worst. He's going to pay. In verse 33, and he identified it and said, it's the robe of my son. Fierce animals devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. His sons and daughters, they rose up to try to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, I'll, no, I'll go down into Sheol for the rest of my life. I will mourn the loss of my son. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And you might know this sets up then chapter 29. But again, when did Joseph's life change? When did he move from that cocky, prideful, self-adulating 17-year-old to the man that he will become even in this next chapter? A man of integrity, a leader, a man of grace and truth, a man of courage. I think it happened in the pit. It happens in the pit. It happens because he was in the pit. He was sold into slavery. It happens at the worst time of his life. God redeems it altogether. Pulls him out ultimately to a new life and to resurrect him, if you will, over time. We often run to Romans 8.28. I want to land, land it here. Romans 8.28, you know the verse. It says, and we know. Let's read this together. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now look at this before we go to verse 29. Because we read that and go, yeah, God's gonna, he's going to do it somehow. He's going to work. Look at this, according to his purpose. Those who are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? It's in verse 29. Those he foreknew, he predestined, he determined ahead of time that we would be conformed into the image of his son in order that he might be the first among bro many brothers. That we might follow him in resurrection. Which is happening now and into eternity. Here's the point. What is the goal of your life? What is the purpose of your life? If it is first and foremost, above all else, to be a disciple of Jesus, what does this mean? If you are saved, you've received his grace, your purpose in life is to become now, till the day you die, just like Jesus. That's the purpose of your life. You wake up tomorrow. What's your purpose? Well, I got to go to work. I'm making money. I got to do some things. I got meetings. I got this thing going on. I got another. I got to do that. What is the purpose of your life? To become like Jesus. I say this because it changes everything. Because everything that happens to you, everything that comes your way, you will see and say, Lord, how are you using this to make me more like your son, Jesus? Are you approaching life that way? And if not, can I say it? Love you. Proves that you're not primarily seeking to become like Jesus. Instead, we see purpose and meaning in all things. It doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So yes, we can ask, why is this happening? That's a legitimate question. God is big enough for that. But when you approach life as a disciple, becoming more and more like Jesus, whatever comes your way, you're saying, Lord, you're going to turn this into good. You're going to turn this into good. You are making me more like you through this. I will persevere. I will trust you. And you stop asking why. You start asking how are you at work right now? How are you going to use this? And even there, you may not get your answers. But then the how shifts to who? Who am I becoming? What story will I tell? And who will I find at the bottom of the pit? You find him. Because we won't always get our answers like Job, like Joseph. We get something better. 
we get God. Because God's presence is better than his answers. Moses knew this. Moses said, if you don't go with us, then we're, we're not going. Because your presence is success. God's presence is success in your life. And if you're walking with him, then I want you to hear this, friends. He has rescued you for his purpose. And I'll just close with this, this illustration. Not so long ago, Stacy and I, we, we're both sports fans. Praise be to God. I married a woman who loves sports. Um, we're watching a basketball game. And we knew who won. But we're like, they won. Let's watch this. But y'all know what happens. Like if you miss the game tonight, Mavericks win. Come on, let's go. And you weren't able to watch it. So you watch it later. But you know they won. You're going to watch it completely differently. Totally different. You're going to be like, we're down 20. Yeah, I know, but it don't matter. We won. We're going to win. No, but like Luca just went out. He's our best player. What? No, no, we're going to win. There's no way we're going to win. No, Kyrie's going to say, no. No, he doesn't. Wait, why? He just fouled out. What is happening? You're not going to do that. You're chilling. You're sitting back, chilling, watching the game. You're just, we win. Pass the chips. We're going to win. And others around you who are going, you're crazy. Why aren't you totally stressed about this? No, nah, we win. You see where I'm heading, friends. We know the rest of the story. We know where this goes. We live with that kind of hope. We're not the anxious ones in the world. I'm tired, I'm sorry. I'm tired of Christians being all up in there with everybody else. The world is going to hell. Our country is going down. We are going to be destroyed. We've got to end those people who are against us. We've got to come against them. We're going to be more polarized. We just need to stand up and fight instead of saying, no, no, we know how this ends. We got this. Because we're part of another kingdom. Not this one. And as we live in exiles in Babylon, we show everyone what it is to trust in a savior who has got us because his plan cannot be denied, not be denied by betrayal, not be denied by our suffering. And it will not be denied by apparent death because Christ died on the cross. Apparently he was dead. He was really dead and he rose again so that we too could find resurrection. Even in the midst of our pain, he will pull you out of the pit as you turn to him. And he's doing it in your life right now. Trust him. Trust him. Give him your life. I want us to pray together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Lord, I pray for every person here and people who don't know you. This promise applies to those who do. Without you, we are, we are suffering. We are, we're running the race. Without your grace, there's no way that we can find purpose in this life. So Lord, I pray that you'll bless everyone here. Those who do not know you, would they come to you now? Friend, just say yes to Jesus right now if you've never received his grace. He died on the cross for you. Turn your heart to him. Give your life to him right now. And for the rest of us who are already convinced, but living like the world would you turn your heart to him right now and say, no more. I will trust in you. Though you slay me, nevertheless, I will trust in you. So Lord, we give you our lives because you're worthy of it all. And we pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Praise be to God.